Good evening and welcome uh, to this Ian Ramsey Centre Humane Philosophy Project seminar. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce this special event today, which is in honour of uh, Professor Stephen Priest and in celebration of the release of a festschrift uh, celebrating his work philosophically that has just been recently published with Peter Lang. Uh, this is the book. Uh, it's a collection of essays by uh, Stephen's friends and colleagues and students who he's taught and worked with throughout the years and includes contributions uh, from scholars from Poland, Germany, uh, Japan, uh, and uh, other, well, uh, England as well. Uh, and <laughs> There's a few others, and it touches on a wide breadth of topics and includes responses to each essay by Professor Priest himself. Unfortunately, the first run of the book has already sold out, but you can order it from the uh, publisher's site uh, still, uh, and we're hoping that a new edition will be released soon. Um, so uh, it is my great pleasure to do this also because uh, I was a uh, Stephen Priest student here at an informal set of seminars that happened not in a classroom but in various settings around Oxford which have been some of the most fulfilling uh, uh, encounters with philosophy uh, I have had uh, because of the great many people who have joined them and the breadth of topics that uh, have been covered which is also reflected in the book. So, if you could please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Professor Stephen Priest, who is going to talk to us today on the topic of the book, which is From Existentialism to Metaphysics. Well, thank you, Mikolai. I'm not sure you should have invited a priori applause. They might let's see how they feel at the end of the uh, at the end of the talk. Now, a few thanks are in order. I'm very grateful to uh, Benedict Gurka and uh, to Ralph Weir for editing the book. It's uh, a serious labour to put a collection of essays together uh, like that. I'm grateful to my uh, former students, my colleagues, and my friends for uh, authoring their various uh, essays for me and about my uh, work. It's uh, in a way a very pleasant surprise that one's colleagues seem to respect one's work uh, to, uh, to the point of um, trying to refute it and even trying to understand it in many, ca in, in many cases. Um, I mean, given the way uh, universities are, so I, I feel deeply honoured that they've uh, uh, done that. And um, I'm grateful to the organizers of, uh, of these uh, s seminars, especially uh, Dr. Andrew Pinsent, who is, uh, to my mind, a great worker for uh, truth in the world, who really tries to make things happen and succeeds in making things happen, seminars like this. And, of course, to... Um, uh, Mikolai Slavkovsky Roda and, um, and uh, Ralph Weir themselves. Now, what I'd like to do, really, I suppose, is talk about this uh, book um, uh, by looking at the topics, the various topics. I'll take one topic per uh, chapter and say something about each topic in a way from the point of view of existentialism and in a way from the point of view of metaphysics. And this might tell us something about the relationship between existentialism and metaphysics, something about what philosophy is and maybe gesture towards some answers towards some philosophical questions. Now, the first um, paper and my reply um, is about what philosophy is. And uh, Timothy Williamson uh, wrote the paper and uh, my reply is uh, the first reply in the replies section. And it, this, this exchange between Williamson and myself is really about what philosophy is. Now, I'll tell you what I think philosophy is. Philosophy, on my view, is the attempt or the effort to answer philosophical questions. This definition doesn't get us very far until we know what makes a question philosophical. Now, I think a philosophical question is not necessarily a question to which we don't know the answer. Some of us might know the answers to some philosophical questions. A philosophical question is a question we have no method for addressing. Right? 
So in physics, we've got a rough idea of the methods that we're going to use, usually a rough idea of the experiments that we uh, might conduct or the mathematical models that we might construct. In history or in archaeology, we have a, at least a rough idea of the documents that we might consult or the excavations that we might uh, conduct. In mathematics, we might have an idea of the proofs that we might like to uh, construct. But philo philosophical questions are not like that. Uh, the, the, the questions are, that are philosophical are all and only those questions which really we have no method at all for answering. Now, it's a consequence, a causal consequence of this view, or not a logical consequence, a causal consequence of this view, that um, philosophical questions have no single subject matter. Phil philosophical questions have no single subject matter. So, some of them are about the relationship between the mind and the body, some of them are about numbers, some of them are about whether we should obey the state, some of them are about life, whether there's life after death, some of them are about whether the universe had an origin, but there's no single subject matter that runs through uh, philosophical questions. And that's a peculiarity of uh, philosophy. Other subjects are uh, peculiar. I mean, archaeology is peculiar. It destroys its subject matter as it uh, conducts its inquiry, or it used to. I, did, I haven't done any archaeology since 1984. Um, uh, uh, history is a peculiar subject matter because in a, in a, it has a peculiar subject matter because in a sense its subject matter did exist but does not exist. Um, uh, so it studies things that don't exist. But you could argue that certain processes or object conti objects continue into the present, of course, but insofar as they do, they're not really subject to historical inquiry. All right, so every subject has its, uh, has its, has its peculiarity, and that's uh, philosophy's peculiarity. Now, um, I think, therefore, in philosophy, what we're tr we, we are either doing, or at least should be doing, is thinking up techniques of problem-solving and actually, um, when a new technique of problem solving is invented or discovered, the uh, problems that it addresses cease to be philosophical. I can think of historical examples of that. For example, when uh, the gene was discovered in the, in, the, uh, in the 19th century and genetics was invented in, in the uh, 19th century, um, whether... Uh, knowledge is innate, to, or how much knowledge is innate to the human being and how much is acquired through experience, in a way, to that degree, ceased to be a philosophical question and began to be a scientific question, because a new kind of science had been uh, born. So, so the way I env envisage it, you see, um, questions are weaned off philosophy by the uh, invention or discovery of methods of problem solving. Now, if that's what philosophy is, <coughs> um, Existentialism is a, is, a, is a part of philosophy, a branch of philosophy. If, if philosophy is the attempt to answer those questions, existentialism is the attempt to answer a subset of questions, uh, questions about the human condition construed in a fairly profound way. Um, how should I exercise my freedom if my freedom is uh, real? What's the nature, well, what should be the nature of sexual, political, or other kinds of uh, co commitment? Is it right that uh, I should fear death, or is really death not something uh, to be feared? Am I responsible for my actions? Is there a real difference between right and wrong, or, or are values just invented by human individuals or, or human uh, societies? Um, is it right that there's an endemic kind of anxiety or dissatisfaction in humanity? If so, what's the, what's the reason for that? Is it humanity's fault? Is it natural to human? Is there some sort of, is, is there some sort of theological explanation for that? Right? So there's a cluster of problems which pertain to existing as a, human, as a human being and possibly existing per se, which are called existential questions or existential problems, and existentialism is the attempt to solve those uh, problems. And it's noticeable that existentialism is conducted very interestingly through novels and plays, not just through uh, philosophy books. Right, now, um, if that's what existentialism is, still with this Williamson Priest idea of uh, what philosophy might be, um, <clears throat> we can ask, well, what is metaphysics? Now, metaphysics is, again, a branch of philosophy. And in metaphysics, we try to answer profound questions about the nature of reality. Uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, what is it to be? 
Um, is it possible to know reality as opposed to appearance? Uh, are there substances, things which depend upon only themselves for their own existences? Uh, is there life after death? Um, these, are meta these are metaphysical questions. Does God exist is a metaphysical uh, question. Now, um, in order to look further at the relationship between existentialism and metaphysics, I'll turn to further topics in the book, for which purpose I'll have to look at the contents page again. Uh, yeah. I won't take them in the same order, actually. I'll, I'll, look at, I'll do it in a kind of heuristic uh, way. If we look at Michael Inwood's paper, Michael, who unfortunately died fairly recently, Michael uh, has put a paper in here about being and, uh, and uh, nothing. Now... Um, um, the notions of being and nothing uh, crop up in existentialist philosophy in a conspicuous way, and they crop up in metaphysical philosophy. Now, I'll just say someth something about the sorts of philosophical questions that may, why, might make one think about being and nothing, or being and non-being. We can ask a cluster of questions. What does it consist in to be? Or what is this existing that everything is getting on with? Or what's the difference between being and not being? Um, is there such a thing as nothing? Or is nothing absolutely nothing? Um, now, there's a cluster of questions like that. And uh, in existentialism, uh, well, there's a large number of works or, yeah, books and articles which bear on this cluster of questions. Now, I suppose salient in all this is Martin Heidegger's 1927 book, Being and Time, Sein und Zeit. Now, Heidegger's 1927 book is a sustained attempt to answer the Seinsfrage, the question of being. Now, there's a question about whether Heidegger is an existentialist. Um, Heidegger thinks that Heidegger is not an existentialist. Uh, Sartre, in the 1945 uh, lecture, Existentialism and Humanism, says that Heidegger is uh, an, eg an existentialist. Um, in the 1949 essay on humanism, Heidegger implicitly at least replies to Sartre and denies that he is an existentialist. And then in the 1967 paper, The Ends of Man, Les Fins de l'Homme, uh, Jacques Derrida says that uh, uh, Heidegger has actually misunderstood himself and that uh, Sartre has a far more uh, penetrating understanding of Heidegger than Heidegger has of Heidegger, and Heidegger is indeed uh, an existentialist. Now, um, if we understand by an existentialist someone who's concerned with this cluster of problems that I mentioned earlier on, then Heidegger is an existentialist. Now, there's another reason, to my mind, why Heidegger is an existentialist. In uh, Being and Time... Heidegger rightly says, in my view, that um, Aristotle is sidetracked or diverted from asking the question, what is it to be or what is it to exist, onto a different question, roughly speaking, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for something being a substance? Now, I think Heidegger's right about that. That's a summary of what Heidegger says. But on my view, Heidegger himself is distracted or... Um, um, drawn away from the question of being, what is it to be, onto another question, which is, what is the nature of human being? And instead of inquiring into sein, or being, directly in being and time, Heidegger concerns himself with what he calls Dasein, or being there, or determinate being, or being in the uh, world. Now, what is meant by Dasein, this technical term in, 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 Heidegger's, in Heidegger's German, Dasein is a kind of being, but not a kind of being, it's the kind of being that pertains to human being. So it's not wrong to understand Heidegger's uh, Dasein as human being, as long as we understand uh, un underline the word being three times, right? Dasein is, is, is um, human being. Uh, 
it's the, uh, human being in this uh, sense of Dasein um, is a kind of being, but not in the manner of uh, this being a, a kind of being and this being another kind of being and this being another kind of being. It's something completely different from that. It's being in the sense of being something or being in the sense of being someone or being in the sense that the un it is not identical with the undergoing of it, but if something is something in, in this sense, there's such a thing as being it. There's such a thing as being the thing. Right? There's such a thing as being it. It's that notion of being that Heidegger is trying to capture, the notion of being something. In his very interesting 19, uh, 1986 book, um, The View from Nowhere, Thomas Nagel has a two or three page discussion of what, of what he calls uh, being someone, being someone. And uh, Thomas Nagel, rightly in my view, thinks there's a profound problem about what it consists in for something or other to be oneself. Well, the kind, the, the kind of being someone that Nagel's talking about in The View from Nowhere uh, is the kind of being, on my view at least, that, uh, that Heidegger's talking about in, uh, in uh, his discussions of uh, Dasein. Now, um, well, just as an aside, uh, when that book came out in, in 86, I, su I suggested to uh, Nagel that uh, he, Nagel, is uh, an existentialist. And uh, Nagel said, uh, oh, Stephen, the language, the language. Right? So he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept it. But I think he is a kind of um, analytical existentialist, or some would say clear existentialist. His books are about uh, value and death and being someone and uh, responsibility and choice and things like, things like that. Uh, so Nagel is an existentialist. But, but if you look at all these people I'm mentioning, they don't think they're existentialists. It's verging on the necessary condition for being an existentialist that you deny that you are one. It's getting very, cl very close uh, to that. Um, now... I've said all that about Dasein because although Being and Time is an immensely profound and interesting and thought-provoking book, which the Western world is only beginning to come to grips with, despite all that, um, it's not really about the question of being. It's about the question of human being, and that's why it's existentialist. The question of what it is to be a human being, underlining the word being, is an existentialist question. It's not... Uh, it's not um, very clearly a question of fundamental ontology, or it's not straightforwardly a question of fundamental ontology. Now, what does Heidegger, which is the name that Heidegger gives his own philosophy. Now, what's meant by fundamental ontology in Heidegger? Um, in, insofar as he's doing fundamental ontology, he's, uh, on my view, um, weaning himself off existentialism and beginning to do uh, metaphysics. Um, he, he doesn't think he's a metaphysician either, but uh, never mind. Uh, but um, now, to understand what fundamental ontology is, uh, we need to draw a distinction between two questions. Um, number one, what exists? And number two, what is it to be? Right? Now, the answer to the first question, what exists, is going to be some kind of uh, list, and philosophers will disagree, and other people will disagree about what should be on the list of things that exist, or types of things that exist. Some, someone's, someone's list might include physical objects, mathematical points, uh, the archangel Gabriel, um, corners, uh, acts of political aggression, emotions, regrets, right? You could imagine someone having a list, oh yes, all these things exist, okay? Now, ordinary ontology, or the branch philosophy called ontology, is the attempt to establish the right list. Ontology is the study of what exists and the attempt to show what exists and what does not exist. That's ontology, or ordinary ontology, um, which is a very worthy, interesting uh, pursuit. Now, fundamental ontology is something quite different from that. Uh, fundamental ontology is... Suppose somebody's list is right. Somebody's, I mean, we might not know whether they're right or not, of course, but supposing hypothetically somebody's list is right, uh, what is it to be on the right list? What does that consist in? In other words, what does it mean to say that uh, these things exist? Or what does it mean exactly to say that they are rather than are not? Or what's the difference between being and uh, not being? Now, uh, that's what fundamental ontology is, the attempt to explain 
being rather than uh, not being, or being rather than nothing. Now this, see, now, this seems to me to be a metaphysical question. It's, in fact, it is a metaphysical question. What, what is it to be in the sense that I uh, outlined uh, earlier on? So what we need, what, what's interesting here is the possibility of a move from doing existentialism to doing metaphysics, a move from in Heideggerian terms, into inquiring into Dasein, into inquiring into Sein, or from inquiring into human being to inquiring into uh, being. Now, Heidegger thinks that um, it's not possible to inquire into being without inquiring into human being, but I don't think this is uh, right uh, for two reasons. One is, if you think that um, the inquiry into being needs, needs to be... Uh, via an inquiry into a being, then any, then any being would do, any being would do. And this claim that I'm making now is right on my view, even if it's true that Dasein is the site of the disclosure of, uh, of being, which in a way it is, I think. Uh, and the other reason why I don't agree with Heidegger on this is that um, uh, it's possible to inquire into being, so to speak, monolithically um, in... Uh, analytical philosophy, uh, and in uh, Kant, there is discussion of being, or the question, uh, what, what does it mean to exist, uh, in a way that's always parasitic upon the existence of one thing ra rather than another. Now, it's quite a good question. Uh, what does it mean to say that this exists or uh, that uh, exists? But actually... Uh, to my mind, it doesn't advance the inquiry fundamentally to assume plurality or to always ask the um, question, what is it to be, in a way that uh, presupposes uh, the existence of a plurality or um, a number of individual objects. It's this sort of thinking that generates the question, is exists a predicate, i.e. is existing a property, a property of uh, the objects that exist, for example. It's possible to inquire into uh, being monolithically, i.e. ask what the, what the difference is between being and nothing, or bare being and uh, nothingness, completely without uh, inquiry into the, um, into the being of particular objects. And I think the... Uh, unquestioned assumption that studying existence or studying what it is to exist depends upon finding out what it is for this, that, or the other to exist leads to various de dead ends. I mean, I think, um, for example, um, uh, Quine says uh, to be is to be the value of a bound uh, variable, but if you ask, well, what is it for a variable to be bound in logic? It, it means essentially to be prefaced by the existential quantifier, the capital backwards E. But if we try to understand what the meaning of the existential quantifier is, it turns out that the existential quantifier means there exists at least one. There exists at least one. And so Quine's account is uh, circular. We always already have the notion of existence smuggled into the existential quantifier. There exists uh, at least one. So it won't really do as an analysis of uh, exists. Similarly, for Frege's analysis of uh, exists, um, Frege thinks to say that something exists is to say that there exists at least one of it, and to say that something does not exist is to say that there exists zero of it. Well, on some level, that's, uh, that's no doubt uh, right um, on, on, on some level, but it's not adequate as an analysis of existence because there exists um, at, least one, at least one of it uh, presupposes the notion of existence that we're trying to analyze. Right. Now, if we examine being monolithically, being as opposed to uh, nothing, there's a number of things we can say. I think one thing we can do is follow uh, Heidegger's advice to um, restore early Greek thinking. Heidegger thinks we have to return to thinking which predates not only Aristotle, but also predates um, uh, Plato. And we have to look at the... Um, we have to look at the thought of the pre-Socratics, especially perhaps um, 
Parmenides and Heraclitus in order to address the question of being as the question of being. Um, and maybe an Aximander as well, but, but Parmenides and uh, Her Heraclitus. Now, um, I'm inclined to do that and um, draw a very clean distinction between being and uh, beings and say that uh, beings are the plurality of things that there are, but um, their being, being rather than nothing, is what it consists in for there to be anything at all uh, rather than uh, nothing. Now, Parmenides... Uh, no, no, I think this, this is a metaphysical thought, you see. This is a meta metaphysical thought. The thought that there can be, so to speak, pure being or being uh, full stop. But I think we arrive at this view partly by putting on one side the plurality of things that there are, intellectually speaking, and partly by realizing that being is not being something. Uh, being is not being F for some value of F. Being rather than not being is not being mathematical or being is not being uh, round or being is not being political or being is not being um, a, a book or a lectern or a university uh, or the House of Parliament or, so, or something, right? Uh, to say that um, X is F for some value of F doesn't, doesn't give you uh, an understanding of what it is to be. Now, if you take these two, these two roots, the um, uh, elimination, if you like, of plurality, which is the course that Parmenides uh, takes, and you realize that being is not some sort of uh, straightforward property. I mean, pr being might be, the, might be some other kind of property, a property of things that are. I mean, I mean, supposing a property is anything that's true of anything, it might be true of the things that exist, that, 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 that they are, or they participate in being, and you know, in that sense they have a property. But obviously, uh, being rather than not being is not some sort of empirical uh, property. Uh, then... Uh, uh, you're left with pure being. Now, I think Parmenides is right when he says that uh, there is being, there necessarily is uh, being, but there is no uh, nothing. Parmenides says there is no nothing. Um, now, there, now, there are various reasons why he's right about that. There's no nothing because there not being nothing is essential to what nothing is. If, right? That is uh, nothing. It wouldn't be nothing if there was something that nothing was or if nothing had some sort of being, right? <laughs> nothing is absolutely nothing whatsoever. So that's one reason why Parmenides is uh, right. Another reason is, on my view, uh, there is nothing, that claim or that statement, there is nothing, is, in, is, in, is incoherent or necessarily false. There is nothing. Now you might think, well, how on earth could that be? There is nothing incoherent. I mean, surely there might not have been all this, right? There might have been no books. There might have been no university. There might have been no planet. There might have been a uh, uh, void. There might have been uh, uh, Democritus. There might have been uh, not atoms in the void, but just the void. What's, what, how, can, how can it be incoherent, this supposition? Now, it's certainly right that there might not have been any beings. It's certainly right that there might not have been any beings. Then for, for, for any object, you choose it, um, it might not have existed. But this is not the, cl but this is not the claim uh, that uh, there could be nothing, that there could be uh, absolute nothingness or absolute, uh, absolutely nothing at all or absolutely nothing whatsoever. And the reason why, that, why that's wrong, the reason why uh, there can't be nothing is that there is nothing in this sense is uh, contradictory because it means there exists non-existence or there exists absence of existence or there is or has, it has some ontological status, this absolutely nothing whatsoever. But, that, but that's, uh, that's, in, that's incoherent. Now, if that's right, um, it's necess it necessarily follows that there is being rather than nothing. In fact, it necessarily follows that there's uh, being and there's necessarily no nothing. Now, 
we're deep into metaphysics here, as you've probably noticed. Uh, and um, what I want to say about this pure being, pure being, there is no nothing, and there's only pure being, is that Parmenides describes or lists in his poem, the earliest work of Western philosophy arguably is a poem, uh, Parmenides goes to visit the goddess, Parmenides asks the goddess, tell me the way of uh, truth and the way of, uh, he says, she says, come on my chariot, come and visit me. Yes, he does. And um, the way of truth is a description of the properties of pure being. Now, pure being has um, certain characteristics um, it is one, it makes sense to divide beings or say that there's a plurality of beings, but um, on, the, on Parmenides' view, it makes no sense to divide being or say that there is a plurality of beings in this sense of pure being or being monolithically. Or you, uh, the, the second thing is, clearly, being is not uh, uh, something physical or something mental. Uh, now, Parmenides is right about that, even if materialism was true. Even if it's not true, but even if it's true that, ev that only physical things exist, bare existence or the existence of anything come what may would not itself be physical, even if only physical things exist. Th the idea that things are physical is an idea that exists at the level of beings, not at the level of being, not at the level of pure being. All right, so we've got this. Um, thirdly, Parmenides says that... Um, being is unbounded or infinite. Uh, thirdly, or fourthly, I can't remember now. Uh, Parmenides says that being is a sphere, spheron, a, a, a sphere. Now, this is quite interesting. In some of the secondary literature, um, people are wondering what, how being can be a sphere as... Uh, as um, Parmenides anticipated the early, uh, is he an early anticipator of the view that the, the world is round? Or uh, what is this? How can being be a sphere? But I think these interpretations are all from what we, what we could call the standpoint of exteriority. Hi, um, Parmenides means you are at the center of the sphere. You are at the center of the sphere. You are at the center of the sphere. Okay, now I'm following a recommendation of a pre-Socratic, Heidegger, uh, a recommendation of an uh, existentialist, Heidegger, that we pursue early Greek thinking. And we do that in order to do metaphysics. We do that in order to answer a metaphysical question or an existentialist question, what is it to be? Or what does it consist in for there to be being rather than uh, nothing? Now, um, we can push this metaphysics further by realizing that pure being in this sense has the, properties, has the properties of God. Because, look, for a start, uh, pure, unless there's being, there can't be anything at all. And one of the important characteristics of God is that the existence of God is necessary for anything whatsoever. Secondly, pure being is not in any way physical. And one of the characteristics of God is that God is not in any way physical. But of course, because God is almighty, God can take on uh, physical form if uh, God uh, wishes. Thirdly, um, we can wonder whether it makes, to, makes sense to say whether there is anything that causes everything or whether there is anything fundamental that makes everything happen or brings every, anything at all about that happens. And I think that uh, the most plausible fundamental candidate for this is uh, being in this sense of pure, unbounded Parmenidean, uh, Parmenidean being. Or as I put it in the way I think about it, being beings, being beings. Or as, a th as we might put it in theology or in, uh, or in thinking about God, God creates, God creates. Now, there's quite a lot more that could be said about this, but the more one uh, inspects Parmenidean being or Heideggerian being, had it been pushed to its logical conclusions by Heidegger or its pre-Socratic conclusions by Heidegger, the more it looks as though being is the being of God. Now, of course, this view that being is the being of God must not be confused with some sort of view according to which God is the universe. Uh, I uh, reject the view that, uh, that God is 
the universe. The universe is the set of beings. But the set of beings is a product of being because being beings. So on this view that I'm describing, there's quite a strict demarcation between God and creation or between being and beings. It's essential to this view that being is not the same as beings and beings is not, are not the same as uh, being. But um, uh, beings being entirely uh, depends, upon, uh, depends upon being. Now, now, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but I'll say something about a, a different question. How much time? Um, where are we going with this? Left uh, only. Yeah. 20 minutes, okay. Oh, we've done one of the uh, <laughs> topics. In the, okay, right, okay. Um, right, right, right. Well, the way Benedict Gurker writes about um, the relationship between God and the uh, universe and the way Martin Pickup writes about uh, change and the way... Uh, Emily Atkins writes about mysticism and philosophy. Th those three chapters bear on a, a very interesting philosophical question um, or cluster of questions as usual. W uh, why is it now? Or what is it consistent for the time to be now? Or how come there's such a time as uh, now? Sometimes the most difficult part of philosophy is uh, understanding the questions. One, one, one obstacle to understanding the questions is that we think we understand them already, but we very much do not. Um, now, uh, you, you might say, oh, well, Stephen, you know, the reason why it's now is that the, you, this is as far as the universe has got. You know, it's billions of years ago, there's the Big Bang, and uh, um, we've got to this point, and the point the universe got to is, uh, is now. Well, I knew that, but um, the, the question is more profound. The question is, um, uh, look, um, choose any time you like in history, in the past, uh, now, or in, in the future. Uh, the universe has only got that far. It's characteristic of any point in time uh, since the Big Bang that the universe has only got that uh, far. So, you know, William the Conqueror could say, oh, uh, it's uh, now, it's, uh, it's now, now. Uh, I'm on my way to uh, fight the Saxons. I'm coming over the channel on my boat, right? It's now, it's now, now. Or somebody in the future could say, oh, it's uh, now, you know, it's 2030 or something. All right. Uh, but the point is, um, it really is now, now, or it seems to be really now, now. Uh, so the question is why it's now. Um... Sartre, in the chapter on temporality, which is a very interesting chapter, in, uh, the, uh, in uh, Being and Nothingness, 1943 book, Lettre et le um, has an, ar an argument along the lines of, um, well, the past did exist, but the past is over, so the past does not exist. The future will exist, but the future hasn't happened yet, uh, so the future doesn't exist. And the present, that's a disappearing uh, instant or uh, something that's so elusive as to be neither. As soon as it's here, it's, uh, it's, it's gone. Now, the first two parts of his argument are right, and the third part, up to a point, is right. But the third part of his argument only applies to what goes on in the present. Within the present, events are perpetually replacing one another. But the time when they are happening is not. Sartre is right that there is no past and there is no future. That's not to say that nothing happened and nothing will happen. Of course, things will happen and things did happen. Uh, but when something happens, it happens in the now, right? So what I'm doing is drawing a distinction between, if you like, what happens now and when what happens happens. Now on this view, whenever anything happens, that time is now. And uh, in a sense, in some sense of there is, uh, there is no time that is not uh, now. And so, I mean, if you went out onto St. Giles and asked somebody, if somebody asked you the time uh, and you answered this person, well, it's, it's now, no matter how irritating, no matter how uh, uninformative, uh, this would be the truth. 
It would be, it would be the truth that the time is now. Now, in uh, science, including in uh, physics, we don't have any explanation of uh, the existence of the present. We don't have an account of why the time is now or why there's any such time as now. We can take various philosophical views about it. We can say it's never now because um, any putative now is only the becoming past of the future. The future disappears into the past, and so there's no such time as now. There's some merit in that view because it um, stops us from regarding now as some sort of time interval. It would be a mistake to ask, uh, uh, well, it's 3 o'clock. How, how long has it been 3 o'clock for now? How long has it been 3 o'clock for now? Well, 3, three o'clock is an instant, a, t a time that doesn't actually take up any time. It's, not a, it's a time, but it's not a time uh, interval. Now, perhaps the present is like that. But what I'm suggesting is that if we take the, the first two parts of Sartre's argument seriously um, and subtract the past and subtract the present, it's only ever now. And we are living in the unchanging now. now you know, if you think that's wrong, if you think it's wrong that the... That the, 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 the now is unchanging, it's because you're thinking about what's going on within the now. Of course, what's going on within the now is changing, is replacing itself. Uh, different shapes and sounds and colors, and if you like, motion of physical objects, all that's going on within the now. Um, but uh, anything that ever happens only ever happens within the now. Uh, this is a different way of thinking from the, from the ways in which we've been conditioned or uh, taught. Kant talks in the first critique, Critique of Pure Reason, about the figurative use of the imagination. And the figurative use of the imagination is the use to think of uh, non-physical things in, in physical uh, terms, right? And he thinks these metaphors are often misleading but sometimes uh, useful. Now... The figurative use of the imagination to think about time is to conceive of time as a line, to conceive of the past infinitely receding like a road behind you, to think of the future uh, infinitely receding like a, like a line in your future. But on the Sartre view, uh, indeed on Kant's view, there are no such lines. Now, once you subtract the spatial metaphors from your thinking, once you subtract the future and the past from your thinking, you're left merely with the now. It's always now. It's never not been now. It's timelessly now. If you think that's wrong, it's because, again, you're thinking of events replacing one another within the now. Right? Now, if you, if you think about uh, the now in this uh, monolithic uh, way, in this timeless, unchanging uh, sense. We now are located in the uh, now. We've never been anywhere else. Uh, you know, we, we've never escaped the now. The now, the contents of the now replacing one another. We're in the, uh, we're in the now. But the now has certain interesting properties. The now, rather like Parmenidean being, is, is unbounded or infinite in every direction. The now is not physical. The now is necessary or prerequisite for absolutely anything that uh, happens, uh, the now, I suggest, is the presence of God. The now is the presence of God. The now is pure presence, not this present thing, not that present thing. The, the timeless now is the presence of God. And St. Augustine was right when he said that when you die, you find out that God was holding us all along because, uh, because when you die, it's still now. When, it, when, when you die, it's still now. It's still now in both senses of still, if you like. Right? No. <laughs> now, uh, now, in a way, this is a shocking view, but in a way, it's a moving view. It means that uh, God is immensely close to you, and you've never stepped outside of God. It means that God is holding you uh, now, and God is inescapably holding you uh, in, by being this presence, whether you like it or not, or whether you believe it uh, or not, or irrespective of whether it's a, a, a matter of, uh, of faith. Now, these, these two uh, problems I've spoken about, we've moved quite quickly from existentialism through metaphysics to theology, but if, we're going, if you want to understand the... Uh, do the metaphysics right, you have to understand it uh, theologically. These two questions are related to one another. 
uh, the question about being and the question about now, or the question about pure being and the question about pure presence. Because um, pure presence, which is the presence of God, is the presence of pure being. It is the presence of pure being. I mean, it is now rather than not uh, now, and I'm not talking about the presence of this or that thing, of course. Uh, so it's the, it's the presence of pure being. Conversely, pure being is the being of pure presence. Pure being is the being of pure presence, right? So being is the being of presence, and presence is the presence of being. They, they require each other. Um, it's not possible to make sense of pure presence except as the presence of pure being. And it's not possible to make sense of pure being except as the being of pure presence, right? They're intimately uh, tied to one another. So coming, coming at this through two philosophical uh, questions, they might appear uh, separable, but in, but in fact they're not. They're ontologically inseparable. I try to hyphenate the expression ontological, I mean um, a, a logical conclusion that has fundamental ontological uh, import by ontological. Right, so um, being is the being of God and uh, presence is the presence of God, but in trying to think in these ways, um, it's very important to not understand presence as the totality of present things, and it's very important not to understand being as the totality of beings or things that are, right? Um, pure being and pure presence are neither one of those. Now, Shogo Shimitsu wrote about the Holy Trinity, and in his paper he also writes about what it is for something to be you. Now, I've given some previous talks about what it is to be you, uh, the kind of invitation of this society, so I won't spend very much time on it, but I'll just say that um, by and large, philosophically and um, scientifically, we've got no idea uh, why something is you. We've got no idea why something is you. Now, as usual, it's hard to understand the question because we think we understand it. We, we think we can say, well, actually, um, you know, I was socialized into this more or less bourgeois environment. I was educated in this place. Uh, my neurology works this way. My genetics are uh, very complicated, but they work uh, that way. I've been exposed to this kind of schooling. I've been, uh, I've been uh, bullied. I managed to escape. I've worked abroad. I learned some languages. Well, that's, why, that's why I'm me. Right? Now, I know all that. I know all that. I've got that. That's, everybody knows that. All right, okay. The question is, once all these facts about you uh, are in place, once all these facts about the particular human being you are, uh, or take yourself to be, are, are in place, it doesn't begin to ask the question, it doesn't begin to answer the question why you are this human being, why you look out of this human being, why you're centered on this human being, why out of all the human beings on the planet, one of them is odd, uh, you're kind of coextensive with it, or you're looking out of it, or um, you feel yourself to, uh, to, to be it. All the billions of human beings who are not you are, so to speak, over there. They're, they're over there in the room, or they're in China, or they're at the Battle of Hastings, or they're in the future, right? But just one of the human beings has got you looking out of it. Now, we haven't got the foggiest idea we haven't got the foggiest idea why one of the human beings is you. We haven't begun to understand the question, most of us, right? Now, once, one, now this is an, uh, this is an uh, uh, Sartan Mello Ponty. Uh, uh, it's quite good to read uh, two chapters in, in their books to generate uh, this question or to get a grip on this question. Both questions are called uh, Le Coeur, the body. In uh, Merleau-Ponty's 1943 book, Phenomenology of Perception, and in Sartre's 1945 book, Being and Nothingness, each contains, a, each contains a chapter on the phenomenology of the body. Each is called the body. And um, 
Sartre and Merleau-Ponty describe the asymmetries or differences between a human body being yours or a, perhaps a human being being you and all the human beings uh, who are not uh, you. For example, you've never seen your own face. You've never seen the back of your own head. Um, you've never seen your own eyes. You go where, roughly uh, where, your human where your human being goes. You view the world uh, from this uh, human being. If you start thinking, well, you know, I could go in the bathroom and look at my face in a mirror, that's to miss the point entirely. That's to miss the point entirely. We don't need a mirror in, in the case of other people's uh, uh, bodies or faces. It's just in your own case that you need a uh, mirror. I don't know whether you've, you've probably seen uh, uh, René Magritte's uh, painting Reproduction Interdite, which has, it's black and white, and uh, a chap, presumably a Belgian chap, is looking in a mirror and he can see the back of his own uh, head. And, I mean, you probably have seen the picture. It's quite famous. It's well, re well reproduced. Uh, a good question is why our experience is not like that. Why can't you see yourself um, uh, in that manner? And uh, the reason is, um, uh, so to speak, you are it, or your being something is an obstacle to your observing something. You do have partial observation of your own uh, body, as you have a different pas partial observation of other people's uh, bodies, and Sartre and Melo ponty are good at describing these asymmetries. Now, in Being and Nothingness, Sartre does this excellent description of the body, uh, but he shies away. He sees the problem. There's a problem about uh, why something is you. But he shies away from it, and he says uh, something like, uh, well, this can't really be an ontological um, problem, and we'll, we'll carry on doing the phenomenology. We'll carry on doing the phenomenology. And it's the most frustrating moment in being and nothingness where he refuses to engage in metaphysics. It's rather like um, uh, Heidegger's uh, leaving being and time unfinished because... Uh, Heidegger is refusing to do metaphysics as he envisages it. He finds Kant, Immanuel Kant, massively in the way of doing metaphysics. Now, I think that um, if you understand this extreme mystery of something uh, being yourself, you'll see that uh, the answer to the question, what is it for something to be you, has to be um, metaphysical or theological. There's no scientific or empirical or indeed m m logical, straightforwardly logical explanation for something's being you. I mean, for example, uh, that something is you is not the uh, logical or modal property of something's being self-identical. You are uh, no doubt self-identical because, of course, for any X necessarily X is X. Everything is self-identical. But from the fact that X is self-identical, it doesn't follow as a matter of logic that X is you. It doesn't give us this mysterious fact of something's uh, being you. Now, there's a lot that I could say about uh, being you, especially by way of criti criticizing Hume, the 18th century Scottish philosopher, who said that he could not find himself in introspection, or he, couldn't, he always comes upon uh, some idea or, or other, no... Um, particular idea of uh, self, no sustained or continuous idea of a self. But, I mean, it's odd that anybody, including Hume, should think that he should be one of his ideas anyway. But um, Hume misses just about everything that's metaphysically important in introspection. He, he misses that, in a sense, he's never changed. In other ways, of course, he's uh, changed. He's uh, gained and shed all sorts of uh, mental and physical properties over his years. But um, as the owner of those mental and physical properties, he is, uh, uh, so to speak, timeless or, un or unchanging. Hume misses that. Hume misses the uh, phenomenological property of meanness. There's a kind of tone or feelness, which is, or feel, which is uh, the feeling of being oneself, the kind of inner tone of being the being that one is. Um, Hume misses the, uh, the uh, Nagel and Heidegger, I'll, bri I'll bracket them together despite Nagel's view, uh, uh, view that there's a special kind of being, which is the being... Uh, of being someone, the being that pertains to human being, being in the sense of being uh, someone. Hume misses that. Uh, Hume misses what I call absolute interiority, the view that 
uh, or the, fa the phenomenological fact that consciousness is an inside without an outside. And uh, this is an absolute interiority. Um, I mean, there might be some sort of metaphysical outside. I mean, there's no physical outside to uh, consciousness, and yet consciousness is given as an, inter as an interiority. Um, he misses that uh, consciousness is given as non uh, physical, and he misses, Hume misses that consciousness is given as though it could be all that there is, or prima facie given as though it could be all that there is. Now, if you put all these uh, properties of uh, one's own um, existence or one's own being together, uh, you look, uh, the more and more you look like a soul in some very strong um, Augustinian or Cartesian or Platonic uh, sense. You look um, immaterial, you look not subject to uh, natural change or dissolution in the way that uh, mental and physical uh, things are. Um, there's something that it really does consist in uh, to be you or something that is essentially uh, you. Now, you, you either have to take a view like that or, you, or supposing all the explanations are either um, scientific or they're mathematical or they're in, in some broad sense empirical if they're not narrowly scientific uh, or they're theological. Once you've e exhausted the first three categories, you have to take the uh, view that the explanation of something's being you is, uh, is theological. In other words, whatever this, um, whatever this uh, property or feature is of being you, of being you, uh, it's bestowed by God. It's bestowed by God. And if you think about it, uh, only something uh, with, with the almighty and transcendental power of uh, God could bestow the property of being you on you. Is this enough uh, for that? Is that, 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 that? Okay, okay. Um, right, there's only three questions, I think, wasn't it? But never mind. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for an extremely rich talk, which, although doesn't exhaust uh, uh, the topics that are covered in the book, uh, touches on almost every topic that is uh, uh, deep and worthwhile to talk about. Uh, we've got about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to ask any questions, and I just wanted to um, take my chair's privileges to ask the first question, um, which is connected with my own contribution uh, to the volume, uh, cheekily, if I may. Um, so. Stephen Priest, of course, is uh, very well known uh, in the philosophical world for combining work on both the continental, quote unquote, and the analytical tradition, writing books on uh, Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, but as well uh, Husserl and Hegel, um, with books uh, like The Theories of Mind, which mainly covers analytic metaphysics and the philosophy of mind, the British empiricists, and currently works on questions um, like free will, uh, the soul, the existence of God's subjectivity, and consciousness, as we have heard, from what would be normally called an analytic point of view. Uh, yet Stephen Priest uh, uh, discards the distinction. Uh, and I think this is, this is very interesting for someone who uh, works in what many would call both traditions to uh, uh, dismiss uh, what people working in just one tradition hold dear to, uh, you know, a sort of uh, trade union demarcation line between themselves and someone else. Uh, and uh, I've tried to introduce a way of understanding that distinction that uh, ru doesn't rub Steve the wrong way, but I feel I've still managed to rub Steve the wrong way with my contribution. Uh, but I'd like to just push you on that question a bit uh, further. Um, uh, uh, having, you know, uh, the experience of working in both uh, the traditions, uh, don't you think there is something to say for, um, uh, as I call it a philosophical temperament or something that you approach these philosophical questions for which we have no method with, that distinguishes the approaches uh, or not at all? Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, you, you don't uh, rub me up the wrong way. That was very mild by Oxford uh, as, as standards that. Um, no, the, the only thing I disagree with is, your, is the use of your word both. It's not the case that there are two something or others here. If you look at the history of philosophy since Kant, Immanuel Kant, um, there is indeed a splitting of post-Kantian philosophies. There is 
hey, the, there is dialectic, dialectic, that method of problem solving found in Hegel and in uh, Marx and later on in Marcuse, Lukács and so on. Uh, there is phenomenology in a way invented by uh, Hegel perhaps, but certainly uh, massively furthered by uh, Husserl, changed by, uh, by Heidegger and changed again by Sartre and Meloponti. There is uh, structuralism arguably invented by Kant in the chapter on the categories, but furthered by uh, Levi-Strauss, Althus, uh, people who are not necessarily uh, philosophers. Um, there is logical positivism, the view that metaphysics is impossible, which is the conclusion of uh, Kant's an antinomies chapter, we can't do metaphysics. He is rather uh, anti-metaphysical. Um, now, I think that uh, there, is, there is obviously linguistic analysis or analytical philosophy, or I'm not sure whether it's analytical philosophy, but linguistic philosophy, the, the doctrine that we can solve or dissolve problems by examining the meanings of words or by defining uh, terms. Um, there's uh, Karl Popper uh, and his uh, philosophy of science and his doctrine of falsificationism. Now, uh, there's existentialism, and there's a certain very restricted amount of metaphysics. Now, all the, there's an explosion of these movements after Kant, and over the last 200 years, these, these movements um, have characterized Western philosophy. These are the movements in Western philosophy, um, structuralism issues in post-structuralism and po post-modernism. Now... Um, it's not right that uh, these are, uh, are two movements. It's not right that these are two uh, movements. There are several movements here, uh, philosophically speaking, and they're all essentially Kantian ways of doing. So really the only quarrel I have with what you've said is both. There's no both uh, here. There are seven or eight or 12 uh, ways or methods of doing uh, philosophy. Th this is to look at what you said um, uh, philosophically. If we look at what you said uh, in your, your paper in the, in the book, uh, historically, if we look at the historical uh, question, it, it doesn't make much sense to say that there are two kinds of philosophy, one called analytical and one called uh, continental. Historically, inter <laughs> sorry, interestingly, historically, nobody's really noticed this, is um, 20th century philosophy was all Austrian. It's all Austrian, right? Uh, Wittgenstein is Austrian. Popper is Austrian. Phenomenology is invented uh, by Husserl, the Austro-Moravian German-speaking uh, uh, philosoph philosophy. The Vienna Circle and logical positivism is Austrian. Gödel is Austrian. Popper, the original, uh, the critic, if you like, of uh, logical positivism is Austrian. And uh, if you, you see, the problem is that people who do the history of philosophy are not trained in history. But um, a historian looking at this debate would look, would look at it historically and, f and quite quickly conclude that everything is massively and overwhelmingly Austrian. And it's just people working in departments doing a degree with a bit of uh, Sartre and a bit of analytical and so on. I think, oh, they're kind of not the same, you know. Uh, right? So I haven't got much patience uh, with it, uh, really. There's quite a lot of German philosophy that's derivative from the Austrian philosophy. And the French uh, philosophy, magnificent and interesting uh, as it is, is entirely dependent on the Austrian and the German uh, philosophy. I mean, without um, Kant, Hegel, uh, Husserl, and uh, Heidegger and, uh, indeed, uh, Nietzsche, there is no uh, Sartre, Merleau, Ponty, uh, Lacan, Derrida. Well, you need Freud in there as well. Of course, Freud is uh, Austrian. Freud, Freud is Austrian. It's massively Austrian. So I think we should just stop using the distinction. It's, it rests on a, uh, on, on a philosophical naivety and a historical naivety. We should ditch it. I mean, whole university departments are premised on the distinction or, or, do, or some pride themselves on doing both kinds of philosophy. Book runs from publishing houses uh, depend on, you know, we're, we're going to do some modern continental philosophy or, or something. So, you know, so I, I don't agree with it. Also, I, I think it doesn't, you see, I, 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 if, you t if you take my view, that we're trying to find methods for solving uh, philosophical problems. We're trying to invent methods. Um, 
you do, you know, you do, you do, you do need at least seven or twelve ways of doing philosophy since Kant, and you are probably going to need uh, Zen Buddhism and music and uh, walking up hills and uh, poetry and uh, all sorts of things, right? Or uh, you're going to have to look at the foundations of quantum physics and see whether they entail consciousness or not. Yeah. So. Uh, the floor is open to questions. If no one has one immediately, I had one. Well, maybe Sam. I think I got there. I got him there before you, Sam, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take, but, but we'll do a quick answer and then Sam, then Roger. Uh, so I'm inclined to ask this about the idea that, that the nowness of now is the presence of God. Yeah. So to yeah. understand the question at all, you take the view that we have to recognize this profound distinction between the respect in which it's really now now and the respect in which it really isn't uh, 1066 now. There's this profound difference, uh, it, it, you know, uh, and you, uh, after a bit of reasoning, conclude the nowness of now is the presence of God. I'm inclined to say, ask something like this. Yeah. Rather than explaining the odd privileged status of this moment, if anything, this seems to make it even more puzzling, right? Why is God showing this extremely gratifying favoritism to us and no, not to no, William the Conqueror? That good. seems the opposite no, no, of what no, no, God no, should do. No, that's very good. No, I see, I see that. I think that's a very good objection, a very good uh, question. I mean, just let me think about that um, for a moment. Um, I mean, I don't know uh, why God has done that, right? But how would I, how would I know, right? How would I know? I, I, unlike Benny, I don't think I'm God, right? Okay. So um, how would I know? Um, the second thing is, I think you've put your finger on an extreme uh, oddness. Um, normally, I mean, in analytical philosophy, the, uh, or at least the popular view in analytical philosophy is that now is when I am. Now, there's a lot in that. There's a lot in that. Now is when I am. So, um, uh, you know, uh, now is the time at which uh, the speaker says uh, this or says now, right? Or now is an indexical expression that refers to the time of utterance. So I say now at 10 past uh, 6 and now refers to 10 past 6, right? You see you you what I mean? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, but if now is when I am. If we think about this phys metaphysically, there's an extreme oddness about that. Um, now is when you are, but now is the demarcation between the past and the present. Now, whether God did it or not, there's something extremely puzzling about the fact of your existence, your own existence, demarcating the past from the uh, future. Your existence demarcating everything that has happened from everything that's to, to come. I mean, wh what is so special about you uh, that you are this dividing line between the past and the future, right? Hi I mean, Heidegger, in uh, Being and Time, towards uh, the end, in the chapter on temporality, um, has a very interesting discussion of whether there's a kind of um, temporality that's presupposed by uh, being being mediated, if you like, through um, being someone, through, da through uh, Dasein. And um, really, um, Heidegger, depending on how you read him there, he's not talking at an empirical level, but he thinks at a more fundamental level, uh, Heidegger has you down as the becoming past of the future. You are. That's what your existence consists in towards the end of being in time. You are the becoming past of the uh, future. That is you. Uh, that is your ontological status. You are kind of Heracleitean. You are uh, becoming. So he's got this idea of Ereignis or, or event, where, which is primordial with regard to notion, notion of uh, being. Um, that, that does, I mean, I don't know why. Uh, I demarcate the past from the future. I don't, I don't know why um, this time is the present time, but it, it doesn't matter how you scrutinize the universe, you're not going to find out the answer to that question. So I think it has been done by God. I mean, how else in a way, right? But I don't know why he did it. I don't know why he did it. Um, I mean, this is a sort of Nick Waghorn uh, question. Um, 
what is the meaning of uh, life and if God exists, you know, does it really help that much? Do we still, do we know it then, you know, do we know it then? Um, I mean, with Er Eignis, it, it, it uh, reminds me a bit of Nietzsche. It reminds me a bit of the, uh, the end of the will to power, the end of the uh, Nachlass, the, the, the 1900, um, where uh, Nietzsche overtly endorses a Heraclitean ontology of becoming, of becoming. And, you know, Heidegger is very interested in uh, Nietzsche. He wrote a two-volume work about uh, Nietzsche trying to rewrite Nietzsche or re-understand Nietzsche in terms of uh, being. And I, I don't know that the Aragonist notion comes, is taken from Nietzsche, but it might, but it might, it might have been. A Heidegger scholar might know. Um, but the thing about... Um, Becoming, even if there is uh, becoming in this Heraclitean or Nietzschean or Heideggerian sense, uh, I think being is more fundamental because um, if you ask of becoming or indeed of anything else, is it or is it not? If it is not, then you know the question can move on. But if it is, then then being is presupposed. Being is presupposed. I think once we start understanding being, we have reached rock bottom. Once we start thinking about pure being, we've reached that than which nothing at all is more fundamental. And that means that it's not the case that there's anything more fundamental than being. This is another respect in which being is the being of uh, God. Because if we understand uh, God, we understand that God is, uh, God is fundamental that without which there can be nothing, or, or God doesn't depend upon anything except uh, God. So this is another respect in which being is the being of uh, God. But it, it's a mistake to think that there could be anything more fundamental than uh, being. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Steve. It was, it was, a, it was a, a roller coaster, as always. Um, well, th thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I wanted to go back to the start of the uh, the roller coaster ride about the uh, question of what philosophy is. Oh yeah. Um, so philosophy as the study of these questions where we don't know we don't know the method for um, solving them. And I was thinking, you could probably find some areas of philosophy. So thinking, here in this university, there are probably quite a few ethicists doing first order normative ethics. They have a fairly stable methodology, which is something mm -hmm. like ref reflective equilibrium, like the or theory of what are the features that make an action the right action, or what are the features of a state of affairs that make state of affairs that makes that a good state of affairs? And then you hit it with counterexamples, which are seemingly counterintuitive, and you refine the theory until the theory eventually lines up best possible with counterexamples, and so on. Yeah. Right. Now, would you? Now, you might say, okay, that there is that methodology is wrong, or we don't have sufficient agreement about it, or whatever, um, for it to count as a method that we know. But supposing that that were, were a good method, and eventually we, that became quite stably adopted, would you say, at that point, ethics would spin off from philosophy and become... If, if, it, if it happened a lot, I think so, yeah. If we found uh, that we could address a, a, a wide range of ethical questions using these uh, techniques, I would say, to that extent, uh, ethics is coming away from philosophy and has its own... Uh, its own, its own method. Has uh, that happened with other subjects in the past? Other subjects? I think yeah. it only happens with... Physics. With Physics. Science, uh -huh. Well... Um, all of them. Well, <laughs> well, if it happens with all of them, there's a reason for that, and that is that w when there's a scientific revolution, the questions are philosophical. The questions are philosophical at that, at that moment or there's a philosophical element to them where we don't know how to go uh, forwards, or we're so, rad we're so radically surprised, the revolution is so uh, radical that um, uh, enormously new methods had to be invented. Now, now, I think science still proceeds by experiment and by mathematical modelling and by... Uh, in a way, for me, one of the main hallmarks of science is uh, measurement. If you can measure the subject matter, then in principle you ought to be able to treat it scientifically. If you can, if you can quantify over it. But um, actually, so the reasons why you know 
whether paintings are, are any good or whether mystical experiences are valid or something is terribly hard to measure in these uh, uh, domains. Uh, but to the extent to which the subject matter is uh, physical, in principle, I think you can, you can measure it. And then you can get a grip on, uh, you can get a grip on pr predicting it. You can conduct experiments with controls and so on. So uh, I think it's measurement that, see, on my view, um, I don't know whether you're very interested in logic, but I think that, that the statements of science tend, by and large, to be synthetic a priori rather than straightforwardly empirical. Uh, and the a priori, the synthetic a priori component comes from, uh, from, um, from measurement and from the uh, repetition of, uh, of results through, ex through experiments. Um, yeah. Uh, That's yeah. very interesting. I, well, Thank I, you. I, 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 yeah, okay. Gentlemen. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I very much appreciated the wide historical sweep here. Um, thinking about the human in terms of existentialism and then existentialism, existentialism in terms of ontology. Uh, and mentioning Plato, I was thinking of Plato's Timaeus, where he thinks as... Um, the now as teleological, the now of human existence is teleological yeah. as opposed to ontological. Yeah. That is the teleology of becoming. Yeah. Uh, and for me, this raises a question of subjective and the objective. Yeah. And you've written about this in relation to Kant yeah. and Hegel. Yeah. I was wondering how the subjective and the objective mm. relates to your talk today, mm. given that we're mm. balancing the ontological and the teleological of the now, mm. and our embracing of God exists in that experience of the now. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you make a, a, lo a lot of uh, very interesting points there, and the relationships between them are very... Uh, complicated, actually, um, but if you if you, if you uh, take a view according to which there's a kind of teleology of the now or a teleology uh, in the uh, now, uh, that's consistent with my view that the now is the presence of God or the now is um, completely timeless. You'd have to say that there are two aspects to the now, or, or there are two dimensions to the now. On the one hand, there is the um, becoming or, or thrownness towards the uh, future of one's own existence or one's own uh, becoming, of course. Uh, but all that is happening within the timeless now. Uh, whenever there's any change towards in the direction of the future, uh, that's um, a, a gaining or a shedding of a, of, a, of a property over time that happens within the uh, now. So I'd have both the Timaeus and the view that I've mm -hmm. outlined as both right but compatible with one another. Then with regard to subjectivity and objectivity, these words are overused in philosophy, a bit like rationality and irra irrationality. And they don't mean much unless we say what we mean by them. I mean, we shouldn't be too hung up on words, but it helps if you do say what you mean. I mean, by subjectivity, we might mean pertaining to one's own existence as opposed to uh, somebody else's. By subjectivity, we might mean to do with consciousness rather than uh, physical objects, or by subjectivity we might mean, oh, it's just a matter of opinion, it's only subjective, it's my kind of preference, I like peas, not uh, fish fingers or something. Um, or it could mean lots of things by subjectivity, and correspondingly the opposites by, uh, by objectivity. Um, well, I think that uh, it really is uh, now uh, and it's now, so to speak, all the time, or it's timelessly now, or whatever time it is, the time is now. Um, and that's an objective fact, if that just means it's a fact, or bang, it is uh, timelessly now, and we're all within the timeless now. Um, but there's still a kind of uh, subjective time, as well as this uh, objective uh, now. By objective, I don't mean over there. I, I mean just everywhere, perhaps. Uh, and by the subjective time, I'd mean, um, well, one's sense of time, uh, you know, the way time goes quicker now that it, that it did, that sort of thing. Um, uh, 
was there a third thing I've forgotten? No, you no, said no, so I, much. I, from what you were just yeah, saying, yeah. I, I was just wondering if, um, if the subjective relates more to teleology than it does to you, uh, Sorry. Ask it again. <laughs> Can you get me some water? From, 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 from what you were just saying, I was wondering if the subjective is more teleological than... No. Than, I think uh, you can have teleology without subjectivity. I mean, um, when I was in Cambridge, you know, more than 40 years ago, Elizabeth Unscombe set an exam question. Uh, the, the, uh, the plant bent in order to be near the light. Discuss, right? And that's a question about uh, te teleology. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Well, it's not subjective mm -hmm. in the sense of, I don't know, mm -hmm. Kierkegaard or Sartre. Mm -hmm. I mean, by teleology, you mean directed towards some goal. Uh, you mean, uh, thank you very much. And, and, and directed. Yes, having a sense of purpose. Yeah, I mean, something might be directed towards a goal, I suppose. It has a sense of purpose. Uh, if it comes right about the plant, it might not have any sense. Therefore, no sense of purpose, uh, but it's still teleological. Perhaps, I mean, perhaps we don't know. Maybe that's why it was an exam question. Um, um, <laughs> Just let, just let me think for a moment. What, what are you going to say? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but it, it's now now. And uh, <laughs> that, that was the time we were going to end. But, but if you'd like just, to, just to conclude just, your yeah, thoughts just on that just question, just and then we'll... What are you for a second? You just said something else. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not conducive, on my view, to understanding the things that I've described that um, our thinking is means to end. I don't know whether it's characteristic of humanity in general or really just something to do with being socialised into capitalist, liberal, democratic, mm -hmm. materialist society, but we always seem to be on the way to something else, the next yeah. cup of coffee or the yeah. next uh, cream bun. And that is uh, a human so condition. Is it? I don't know, you see, because I've only been brought up in liberal... Well, my dad was a communist, but never mind. Um, uh, this sort of untervegs all the time. Now, that stops you realising that it's only ever now, and it stops you realising that we're in the midst of pure uh, being. It's an obstacle to realising that uh, God was holding you all along. OK, let's should we wind it up then. <laughs> OK, no, my pleasure. Right, uh, these were very rich questions, especially mine, I feel. Uh, but uh, uh, we have to, we have to draw to a close <laughs> um, because we'll have to uh, vacate the room, uh, uh, not just uh, now, but in a few minutes. But before, before we do, um, before we do, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Blackfriars Hall, which has hosted this event and where Stephen Priest uh, is a fellow, um, as well as the two institutions immediately responsible for organising this event, which is uh, the Ian Ramsey Centre for Science and Religion, as well as the Humane Philosophy Project, and our sponsors from the University of Warsaw, who have also contributed to making this possible. Uh, so uh, please uh, join me in thanking Stephen Priest for a wonderful lecture and please also look at Peter Lang's website uh, for a possibility to order a copy of this book if you'd like to explore the topics that Stephen Priest talked about today. Thank you very much. Thank you.